Hello, everybody. My name is Damien Shield, and I'm the senior director at the Center for Medical Simulation and lead our faculty development programs. It's exciting to be here with the birds singing in the background uh, from Mary Fay's farm. We're uh, in the middle of a pandemic where, for me, uh, looking for my new normal includes finding my old and teaching and learning and with with my colleagues and with simulation and healthcare educators and leaders internationally is my old normal and so I'm very excited that uh, I'm here and that you're all here and appreciate that you're taking time from your busy lives whether it's with work or with managing the homes and dealing with our current situation that you've taken time for yourselves and for your communities to join on what I think is a great topic with a fantastic learning leader. So I'd like to hand off um, very shortly to Mary Faye and Chris Rusen. I'll let you know that uh, this is our weekly webinars. We're um, glad to have these opportunities and I'll be popping in at the very end to let you know about next week's session. I'll also be helping out with Mary and Chris with your questions. So please use the Q&A chat box as uh, a way to communicate with us so that uh, when uh, you're taking in the conversation. You can interact with us by typing into the Q&A. I will be monitoring there, answering the questions that I can, and then bringing to Chris and Mary uh, the salient ones so they can answer during their presentation. So without further ado, uh, very good morning to you all and Chris and Mary, your stage. All right, thank you so much, Damien. Um, Thanks, good Damien. morning, everyone. Chris and I are gonna take a minute here to introduce ourselves before we jump into the webinar. Uh, my name is Mary Fay. I am a critical care nurse by background and for the past oh, 10 years or so have been working in simulation the past five years or so, um, intensively working in faculty development for simulation educators and uh, was really fortunate to, to team up with Chris on his uh, Circle Up project and I think one of the things that I really value so much about Circle Up is that just like good teaching, it's all about human beings connecting with each other in meaningful ways to do important work. So I'm really excited to be here today with people from all over the U.S. and the world. And uh, I'm going to hand it off to my buddy, Chris. Thanks, Mary. Welcome, everybody. So good to be here with you. Uh, my name is Chris Rusin, also from Center for Medical Simulation. I work a lot with our international clients and our partnerships and anything we do that's a consulting relationship. Uh, my training is in organizational behavior and, and the psychology of work. Um, a lot of that training goes into the thinking about Circle Up and the design of Circle Up. So you'll hear me saying things that remind you of my training today for sure. Um, some of my history, just to give you um, an idea of that, before I came to Center for Medical Simulation to work with these great colleagues, I worked at the Boston Children's Hospital Simulation Program, which is this wonderful deeply integrated into the hospital simulation program. That's a part of skill development. It's a part of practicing situations and scenarios until we're ready for them. And also a part of uh, briefing and debriefing before we do our work. And so I got a lot of experience at Boston Children's being deeply involved into the inner workings and everyday operations of hospitals. And I think a lot of that experience has inspired our thinking about Circle Up. Thanks. All right, Chris, let us dive in. Do um, you want to give us just a quick overview here of Circle Up and sort of these three targets that I think Circle Up really helps us with? Yeah, you notice those, those phrases that Mary and I chose today, adaptive teams, resilient staff, and safe patients. And Circle Up is really about all of those things. It's about how do we how do we get to a point where we can keep coming to work every day and be adaptive in this time that requires us to be adaptive? Um, how can we stay resilient? And ultimately, how can we stay psychologically healthy? And uh, with the end goal of keeping our patients safe and also keeping ourselves safe and keeping ourselves well. And, you know, Mary and I remember when Circle Up um, first came together, it was as we could see the COVID surge coming. And now we realize um, how valuable circle up will be as we adapt to 
not the end of the surge, but really um, everything that's happening now and everything that will be happening in the next few years where we need to be adaptive and we need to be resilient and we need to be healthy. Thanks, Chris. So I want to acknowledge um, a couple other important members of our team who are not here in person today, but we, we've been working with people really from all over the world to help them implement Circle Up into hospitals. And we've got some videos from some of the folks that we've been working closely with. Um, and so I want to introduce them to you. One is Leah Tron. She's an anesthesiologist from Massachusetts General Hospital. Rebecca Meinhardt, also an anesthesiologist from Mass General. Uh, Stephanie Langford, who is a CRNA and who leads up the general surgery CRNAs at Mass General Hospital, and then our colleague Lon Setnick from Concord Hospital in New Hampshire. So this has been really our, our primary community of practice that's been implementing Circle Up that, and that we've been gathering data about their implementation practices. I just want to take one minute to talk about our time together today and, and what we hope to accomplish. We've got about 50 minutes during um, which Chris and I will be sort of presenting Circle Up and we've left 10 minutes at the end for your questions. What Chris and I hope to talk about today is what are the benefits of Circle Up? Why, why would an organization be interested or, or make the commitment to implement Circle Up? We'll break down Circle Up into its various um, elements. And then importantly, what we've learned really from our colleagues who are using this on the front lines is the workflow and the information flow that really makes Circle Up effective and feasible and high usability. Um, Damien already mentioned this, but I just want to uh, mention it again, that if you look on the, um, the toolbar with the Zoom for the Zoom meeting, you'll see a little tab called Q&A. And as questions come up during the webinars, I'm sure they will, please type your questions into the Q&A. Damien is gonna um, look at the questions and kind of collate them. And then as he sees themes, he will um, get those questions to Chris and I so that we can answer your questions. So we'll do some in the middle of the webinar, but then we'll also say, have uh, 10 minutes at the end for questions then. Great, Mary. I, I'd add that we, we want you to imagine yourself and your organization or your team uh, implementing Circle Up. And maybe that will help you inspire, oh. help inspire your questions specifically. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Chris. Hmm. So, Chris, I'm going to ask you if you talk a little bit about the value proposition for Circle Up here. Yeah, so as I mentioned, and I think, you know, these are the basics, right? We, we know that we need to be adaptable in this moment that is requiring us to change constantly. We know we need to be adaptable um, in an ever-changing environment. Um, PPE is changing all the time. Um, we are restarting our surgical procedures. Our volumes are going up across our hospitals and healthcare systems and facilities. And this is just as challenging as the sur surge, maybe even more challenging. Um, and in order to accommodate this, we need people to be resilient. We need to be showing up day after day and not just being okay, but actually being really healthy, really strong, really smart, really capable. All of these beautiful characteristics of clinicians around the world and all the, and all the supporting mechanisms as well. So if we can be resilient, if we can be adaptable, then we can provide safe care and we ourselves can be safe. And Mary, I'll just ask you to click. Yep. And so one of the innovations that we've come up with, you know, click back one if you Sorry. can, yep. yeah, no problem, is we know that if we have great huddles and if we have great coordinating mechanisms, it may be a little bit of a nerdy term, but we need w ways to get together so that we can coordinate our work and so that we can talk and that will improve our adaptability and that will improve our resilience. We know that. Go ahead and click again, Mary. What we're realizing more and more is that to do any of this, we need psychological health and that that psychological health is being very much threatened by the stress of the surge, by the stress of what's happening overall in society and the world with our families, with our work, with everything. Um, and that we need ways to support that psychological health. Otherwise we can't access our adaptability and we can't achieve our safety. So I'll ask you to click one more time, Mary. Um, how do we improve psychological health? Some, from some of my science, we know that we need to give people an opportunity to have a voice in the change that is happening 
all around them, um, to participate in solutions and decisions as changes are made, and um, really overall to be emotionally supported. If they get those things, we know that psychological health will be better, and this will allow us to be more resilient and adaptable and support safety. And one more click, Mary. So one solution that we can come to is how do we make our huddles more supportive of voice, participation, and emotional support? So when we get together in our work groups, we need to support those things. And Circle Up is really a lot about that. And we're going to tell you how that works. Mm -hmm. OK, so Circle Up is a system that has three parts, really, three profound parts. The first part of Circle Up is a briefing where we talk before we work. And as I said, it's not just any talking before we work. We, we discuss the latest process and protocol changes, but we have important places in our briefing to support people and teams, clarify who's working on what, but also provide emotional support, provide voice and provide participation in decisions. We also need an opportunity to mentally rehearse the new things that are happening that day so that we come out with an idea of what our plan is. Second piece is a system of peer check-ins. So how do we talk while we work? So Circle Up includes mobilizing the whole group of people who are working to check in with one another and really informally help one another by checking in, by talking, by listening, and by offering support. And then the third component of Circle Up is debriefings. And if you know anything about the Center for Medical Simulation, you know we talk about debriefing and we really care about it. We really care about doing it well. In this case, it's, it's, a, it's, a part, it's an important part of a three-part system mm -hmm. where we talk after we work, we process what went well, we process what was difficult, and we explore the root causes of what's going well and what's difficult. And we ultimately come up with a plan for what we need, and we also provide people some emotional resolution, the ability to go home and rest and leave their work mm -hmm. at work for a few hours. Yeah. And you know, Chris, I'm sorry, you know, as, as I'm listening to you talk about these three separate pieces, one of the things that I'm really, um, I've been really struck by in, in talking with Leah and Rebecca and, and, and Lon is how they're so interconnected and they interact so well together that it almost becomes this web of communication that happens in different ways. And it's, it's really not three separate things. It's really a connected system that brings people together in various ways throughout their shift, which I think is, is something that's really been great about Circle Up. Agreed, Mary, that those stories have been amazing to hear yeah. and inspired to hear. I'll say this, the Circle Up design, Mary reminded me of this, includes this circle. So why do we call it Circle Up? It includes this loop of communication such that the briefing is informing how we check in with one another during the day. Mm -hmm. And the check-ins are and the briefing are both informing the debriefing. And then what we learn in the debriefing um, immediately gets back to the next group of people who are starting up work so that we're spreading our learning and we're sharing our learning. So mm -hmm. this becomes really a system of continuous learning and support that gets us better all the time. Mm -hmm. All right. So having done that, that larger overview, um, Chris and I are now going to um, break this down and talk about each of the components individually. And um, I will get started talking about the briefings. So briefings or the idea of a team coming together to um, sort of assess and, and plan their work for the day has a long history in lots of high reliability organizations, the military, aviation with pilots doing pre-flight checks. Um, and in healthcare, we've started to adopt this some in OR cultures doing a timeout before um, surgeries. And so we recognize that that would be an important component in Circle Up. And I really see this being important for two reasons. It's not only to coordinate the tasks we need to do, but it's also to coordinate the team. Um, being clear who's on the team. We, one thing we learned during uh, the COVID surge especially is that Clinicians were being shifted around to different units, units they hadn't normally worked on, sometimes units that didn't exactly match their skill set. We had pediatricians providing care to adult patients. We had non-ICU nurses working in ICUs. And so coordinating the team, understanding who's on your team is an important part of a circle of briefing. So the components of the briefing are process and protocol, 
but then people and teams is an incredibly important part of Circle Up briefings. And one of our colleagues, Lon Setnick, who's from Concord Hospital in New Hampshire, one of the things that he says uh, during the briefing to his team is, how are you gonna show each other that you care about each other today? And so it's during the briefing that he kind of plants the seed for people thinking about the peer support component of Circle Up, which I think is incredibly effective to plant that seed because it's much more likely to grow. Um, coming out of the Circle Up briefing, really what you wanna know is who's on my team, what are the challenges we're facing today, and what is our plan to meet those challenges? And so we suggest a couple of roles um, for the briefing, which is there should be someone who leads the briefing, does not necessarily have to be the most senior person or the most experienced person. It's the person who's most enthusiastic about getting the team together and coordinating the processes and the teamwork. One of the things that Chris is gonna talk about in a moment is this idea of doing mental rehearsals. When something particularly challenging is anticipated for the shift, having the team take a moment to say, hey, let's walk through this mentally, guys, and think about what, what do we anticipate, where are the challenges going to be? And so having someone who's willing to coordinate that mental rehearsal um, is also something that we recommend. It might be the person who's most skilled with that particular um, task that's coming up. For example, if it's intubation, we might want to have a respiratory practitioner um, or an anesthesiologist walk us through the mental rehearsal for that. And then finally, with the briefings and the debriefings, as Chris will talk about later, we think it's important to have a scribe to capture innovations, to capture ideas, um, to take notes on, on anything that may need to get fed up to the larger system. So I've got a video that I'm going to show. Um, it's Stephanie Langford, CRNA, talking a little bit about how the briefings were working for her group of CRNAs. Um, and this group of CRNAs was taken out of the OR put on a new ICU on one of the floors at Mass General Hospital, and we're now providing care for ICU patients on a continuous basis, which was very unusual for their team, and Circle Up really helped them meet some of those challenges. So I'll show the video, and then we'll take a few questions. Chris, anything you wanna add there? No, I think that's great. Okay. Everything that respiratory therapy has done with their machines for years, we've now had to transition that into uh, our anesthesia gas machines and the ventilator that's, that's, uh, that, that we use through there to be able to do the same thing for our patients in the ICU world. We gave patient handoff and then we went right into circle up. So it was protocols, policies, what it's looking like, um, the workflow. They started creating a white three ICU pearl sheet and what our responsibility would be. For the first time, we're actually working with each other versus when you're in the OR as a CRNA, it's usually you and an attending. A CRNA may come and give you breaks, but now we're teams of CRNAs, approximately four of us on day shift, four of us on night shift. We're training each other and we're helping each other. Um, so that's a whole other element that we haven't experienced before is working together as a team. Super awesome because things are getting changed very quickly. I think if we didn't have that, it would be much more scattered I've been working in, in the OR in, in off-site in interventional radiology and in the regular ORs. I really want people to speak up if they see an issue. I think that saying that really up front about what I'm, what, I, what I'm focusing on and hearing what other people want to focus on makes it easier for people then to speak up if they see something that would have an impact on those areas of focus. People speak up about, um, notice that other people didn't have adequate um, PPE. Like some people, I've twice now I've had people um, present at induction for getting their face shields. Um, and uh, they spoke up about that, which I don't, I, I don't think normally people would say like, hey, do you want to wear goggles? But I think in these times, if we encourage it, people are grateful for that. And um, a, couple other, a couple other things, like I've asked people specifically to speak up if they notice that one of us touches the oral or nasopharynx, and um, then we touch something else without removing our gloves. And um, I asked the, circul the circulating nurse who's present throughout the induction um, to specifically watch for that. And almost every single time they've had something to give in that area. All right, I think this is a good uh, moment for us to take a pause and uh, Damien, see if there are any questions. So just looking through the chat here, mm -hmm. uh, 
the one question that's come up here is in terms of timing, how long mm -hmm. should these briefings take and when should they happen in the workday? Chris, you want to take this one? You want me to take this one? Yeah, go ahead and grab that one. Sure. Um, so Damien, what we're finding out from the people that you circle up is that, that the briefings take different forms and, and different timings. You know, as you can imagine, especially in an OR with people constantly coming and going and no sort of set beginning of the shift or end of the shift, and emergency departments can be the, the same way. Um, what people are doing is generally, if there is a shift um, after they get handoff on their patients, have the team gather and the briefing, you know, in most places, it's not lasting longer than 10 minutes and can even be shorter than that. It's certainly, you know, it fluctuates based on what's going on in any given day. For example, when, when Steph and her team first opened up the pop-up ICU at Mass General, their briefings were a little bit longer because there was just a lot more new information every day. And so I think it, you know, it can, it can wax and wane based on what's going on in a unit, but you know, a couple of minutes um, really has been adequate for, for most places. Hmm. Chris, Thank anything you. you want to add there? I'd add, you know, we've, we've heard some stories about groups that are combining briefings and debriefing. So as one group is finishing up, there's a debriefing and the other group has an opportunity to actually be present for that debriefing. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing Mary and I want to emphasize with you is that this system of scheduling these conversations can be flexible and it really needs to suit who you are, what you do and what you can do. Mm -hmm. and, um, so as Mary pointed out, pattern is that they're relatively brief, that they always include these aspects of support for people that were, are not normal. We're not used to these aspects typically in our work. And so those are really powerful. Mm -hmm. They typically include very br brief mental rehearsals. And all of that can be done in 10 minutes. It's amazing what you can accomplish in a, in a short meeting. We're learning a lot yeah. about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, one other thing I wanna add here, Chris, that we've really learned also is not to let perfection be the enemy of progress. Mm -hmm. That if your briefings have to be super short or if the whole team can't get there or some days it's just impossible to do it, it's okay. You know, communication of some sort is better than no communication. So please don't wait until it's absolutely perfect um, to start implementing some of these ideas. Mary, one more point. You just inspired me to remember this. All, of these, all of these people, I know you inspire me. One of the, all of these people you're hearing talk, they're really brilliant simulation yeah. educators and debriefers, and they're, they're taking their simulation um, uh -huh. oriented skill sets of briefing and debriefing, just clear communication and a supportive mm -hmm. mindset and curiosity. And they're using those, not for simulation in this case, but to support right. learning in everyday work, to support progress and development in everyday work. I just want to point that out. These simulation skill sets are so powerful. Yeah, transferable. Yeah. So Chris, I'm thinking we'll move on and have you talk about mental rehearsals. Okay, great. Well, you know, throughout the day, um, certainly during the surge, and we're finding out almost even more powerfully post surge. And as we try to adapt back to whatever it is we're adapting to, we know we can't call it normal. It's ever changing. There are mo lots of moments where teams encounter work that is unclear. And, and so there's this idea that you can call your team members over before you're about to do something. And you can say, before we do this, let's, let's circle up. <laughs> let's talk about it. Let's clarify our roles. Let's clarify the action that we, we are about to take because it's not normal. Typically this is triggered by a little bit of anxiety. Okay, I'm not totally confident with this. Let's talk. And we can have a huddle. And again, like I said, the huddle is a clarifying conversation. Um, equally important, we can have a brief mental rehearsal we can actually walk through the, the things we're about to do and um, create clarity and give us an opportunity to ask further questions. And now we're ready to execute on this um, teamwork and then to have a, a short debriefing. And again, this can all happen very quickly. And we take what we've learned from that moment of work and we pass it on to others who are going to do that same work. So we get it for ourselves, but we also provide it to others. And one of the themes of Circle Up is that you you get information for yourself, but also to the other people who can use it. That's a really important aspect of circle mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And you know, when I think about, uh, you know, an event-based circle up that has a mental rehearsal in it, Chris, one of the things that I, I know that people, um, 
not we're anxious about, but, you know, a complex procedure that nobody wanted to mess up mm. was when they had to prone these intubated patients with a million lines in. And I think that's a great example of taking a minute to say, all right, we're going to do this. Who's standing where? Who's got the lines? Who's protecting the ET tube? What's it going to be like when there's PPE on? You know, maybe I'm a nurse that doesn't have the best hearing in normal circumstances, and now I'm putting on all this PPE, and I might need to say something like, guys, please make sure you really speak up, because, you know, I have trouble hearing when I'm all donned up in my, in my PPE. Um, yeah. So again, it doesn't have to take a long time, but just mentally walking through what are the steps, who's doing what, where, when, how, really can, I think, decrease people's anxiety and help us get it right when it really matters. Yeah, so... Thank you, Mary. So two points mm -hmm. here. How do you support this sort of activity with Circle Up? You talk about it in your briefings at the beginning of the day. Mm -hmm. You say, hey, if, if something is unclear or you're worried about it, have a short conversation. And if you see this picture that's on the slide right now, you can actually hang this picture up on the wall, reminding mm -hmm. people to have these sorts of conversations and just want to give you some really powerful um, mm -hmm. quick ideas. And I think what I'd love to do with all of you, we're very interactive folks and we really crave interacting with you. Tell us through the chat or through Q&A, how do we want it, Damien? Um, something that is going to be different in your clinical life right now because of PPE, because of the way the world is changing. Mm -hmm. Some action that's not going to be the same as it used to be that you're anxious about and that you know people need clarity on, they need practice on, and they need to coordinate better around. What's mm -hmm. something that you're worried about? Mm -hmm. So through the Q&A? You want yeah, to wait? Best, and best, best would be there if, if a question okay. could be paced that way. Like, uh, I think that would work. While, while I have the mic, I'll say that there's a question from Juan Cobian saying that some studies suggest that the debriefer is a variable in terms of achieving learning outcomes successfully. Mm. How do you think this would impact mm. an adequate simple circle up implementation amongst institutions? So. Mm the debriefer, but what else needs to be in place? Was the point that the debriefer, so individual people get different results than one another? Was that the point there, Damien? I think they're saying the debriefer is one variable, but what are the other variables that wow. we ought to be thinking yeah. about mm. in terms of... So we will... I think they're re responding to your great comment, Chris, around mm -hmm. people have the skills already, so what else? Yeah, I love the comment, folks. Um, thank you for that question. So Mary and I will talk to you about scheduling and the importance of that. So making time for that conversation and using messages as you recruit people to these conversations, as you bring people to have these conversations, using messages that motivate people to want to have these short conversations. That is an important factor. Mm -hmm. That will affect the attitudes that people bring into the room. Um, and the degree of participation, and I think remembering to invite people, remembering to define, define the debriefing as, as participative. We need to hear everybody's voices. This is so important for us right now. Um, those are a few thoughts. Mary, other thoughts? Mm -hmm. You know, Chris, one of, one of the things that we heard, um, and I'm thinking particularly of Lon, is the value of having a partner. Um, you know, who's just as committed, and, and, and Stephanie found the same thing also. Um, that you don't need to do it all by yourself and that you need to build in your own methods of peer support as you're implementing circle up. Yeah. Um, so I think that's one of the other variables too, is thinking about who's your teammate, who's your partner, who's your co-implementer. Yeah. Agreed. And if you, yeah, if you have a doctor and a nurse, if you have a respiratory therapist, if you have a uh, representation in the leadership of the deep briefing and the debriefing, that can be very powerful. Mary brought up, um, the really great example of mental rehearsal earlier, we just want to reinforce that. If people know that they'll have an opportunity to mentally rehearse, that can be a very valuable feature of a conversation. Mm -hmm. So who takes part in these event-based circle ups? It's really the team members. And we say team leader here, but really it's the person who's inspired to start this clarifying conversation and to say, hey, let's clarify this. I'm a little nervous about it. We haven't done it yet. Or the last time we did it, it wasn't smooth. It wasn't as good as we want it to be. Let's talk. So that's your, that's your team for this. I think I'm gonna move on to peer support, Chris. Excellent. Okay. So, you know, during this COVID time, of course, we've, we've become very concerned about the resilience and the, the psychological health of our 
healthcare teams, I would argue we should have been thinking about this all along and we've never spent quite enough time thinking about this. But when COVID hit, um, we really recognized the urgency of the need for some sort of structure around uh, peer support and peer check-ins. And um, so we teamed up with um, the Debriefing Academy in Canada to develop a framework for a supportive conversation that I'll, I'll show you in a moment. But our motivation behind it really was that we embed in the system almost like permission or encouragement for people to recognize that a teammate needed help or support and to normalize us reaching out to each other to offer that support and also to accept the support, which we tend not to do because we're the helpers and we're the healers and we're the fixers. And sometimes it's hard for us to ask for help. And so when we teamed up with the Debriefing Academy, we created this framework for supportive conversations called Talk to Support. And these Talk to Support infographics are available free on our website and also on the website of the Debriefing Academy. And so the Talk to Support um, framework is this roadmap, which suggests that we start a peer support conversation with an opening invitation and acknowledgement of the difficulties. You know, things have been really difficult for a while. Do you have time to talk? Um, you know, it always helps me feel better if I talk to someone. So would love to talk to you now if you would like to. Always giving people the option to say, not a great time, don't feel like talking. Um, but then as the conversation moves ahead, we suggest acknowledging the challenges and asking the person you're talking to, you know, what's been difficult for you today or what, is, what are the challenges that you've had today? And then thinking through what has helped with those challenges. And again, this is part of the circle up system of capturing those things that work and making sure that we're passing them on to other people. One great example from, uh, from Lon Setnick again at Concord Hospital is that two of the nurses in the emergency department realized that one of the important things they needed for their psychological health was just to be able to take a break off the unit, to have their lunch or whatever without worrying about their patients. And so the two nurses decided at the beginning of the shift that they were gonna constantly keep each other informed about what was going on with their own patients so that when one wanted to leave, the other one already knew about the patients. And so it allowed the one staff member to have some freedom um, to sort of release themselves from the responsibility of their patients and get away from the unit for a little while. Interestingly, also had the added benefit that the ER doc who was on that day was like, oh my God, this is so great. The nurses know all the patients. So no matter who's here, I know what's going on with the patients. And so what started out with a, how can I help you personally, became actually this system of information sharing on the unit that helped multiple people. I think that's the great opportunity of opening up these peer support conversations. So also on um, the roadmap for Talk to Support, after talking about challenges, we also suggest that you think about what are some bright spots? Because even in the midst of all this crisis, there are still some bright spots. And I think it helps us to keep those close to the surface and talk about them, not as a way to minimize the challenges at all, but more as a way to bring some balance to the conversation. And then finally, the last part of the roadmap for the Talk to Support conversation is an explicit offer of support that we very purposefully worded as, how can I support you right now? Because I have this sneaking suspicion that if you ask a doctor or nurse, respiratory therapist, physical therapist, do you need some support right now? They would say, no, 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 I'm fine. And so we purposely worded it as, I'm here, tell me what you need me to do because I want to support you. And then there are a couple elements of the talk to support conversations that we also thought were important, which were to validate a person's feelings, to normalize them and let them know it's okay. And Chris, I'm gonna tell a story on the two of us, which is that, you know, Chris and I this morning just had a conversation about, you know, I'm anxious about this, I'm worried about that. You, you know, many of you know that CMS, um, you know, we love, love, love doing our in-person courses with educators from around the world and we can't do that right now. And it's making us all a little anxious, a little crazy, a little nervous, we wanna get back to that. And so, you know, as Chris and I were talking about this, one of the things we said was, you know, it's totally normal to have this kind of anxiety right now. The whole world is upside down. And sometimes just hearing that from someone you like and respect can go a long way towards really mitigating the bad effects of that stress. And then finally, we recommend empathizing. Like, I've walked in your shoes. I know exactly how you feel. 
And these talk to support conversations don't have to be long, don't have to be super formal. And we're finding that people are doing them in many different ways. So talk to support is just one framework we wanted to offer, but we find that many people are finding ways that work for their particular personality or, or unit culture. So we have a video of uh, Rebecca talking about some of her peer support conversations, but Chris, I just want to check in with you and see if you want to add anything here. I'd, I'd add, you know, there's a lot here, even though talk to support is intended to be simple, there's a lot here and the key move is to listen. Yeah. The key move is to open the conversation and to listen and to yeah. offer support. Yeah. Um, and that it's extremely powerful and we have lots of great evidence that, that this is a, a wonderful thing. And also that as, as you do this for others, you feel better. Oh. So there's actually a direct effect, not just for the person that you're offering support to, but for you. Yeah, agreed. I kind of have in my mind that I want to hear stories from people during the day. And, um, and it could be stories about their day or it could be stories about other things that are going on for them. So I kind of make it a point to pair, I don't know, I just like to link behaviors that I'm doing with an action that I do. So uh, instead of in anesthesia, like I see V-fib and I say, it's V-fib, we need it's the defibrillator, we need to do chest compressions, we need to shock. I'd say, okay, so I'm sitting down and somebody else is sitting down. I haven't heard this story yet. I'm going to ask them how they're doing. So I try to pair anytime I'm resting and somebody else is resting near me or seems like they want to talk to then just ask them the same questions, which is just, hey, how are you doing? How are you really doing? Yeah. You know, I'm thinking yeah. about you. And they're surprisingly brief, but surprisingly for me anyway, they're surprisingly a lot of information I'm hearing about people's kids who are at the front lines and they're worried about their daughter who's a nurse who's at an area hospital doing things that she's mm -hmm. never done before. Now she's an ICU nurse that she was, you know, something else. And mm -hmm. so it's just really, um, it's really nice to have those moments because I feel like it's a little emotional release for people throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So Chris, you know, I think peer support and debriefing in my mind really get connected um, frequently. So how about if we move forward and um, you cover debriefings next? That sounds good. Okay. Okay, so in the debriefing, uh, this is our opportunity after we work or near the end of our, our work is one way to think about it, because after people have worked, you want to let them go. So this is near the end of our work. Um, we have an opportunity to share successes, to share difficulties and challenges, to explore both of those things, um, to make one another feel better and more resolved, and ultimately come out with an idea of what we've learned and what do we need to improve the next time that we work. Um, someone in the Q&A asked the question, do we need the basic assumption? Are we trying to create psychological safety just like we do in simulation? The answer is very much yes. We're trying to, we're emphasizing the fact that um, we respect one another, um, that we are trying to get better, that, that this is a difficult and frustrating time. And these are really the components of the basic assumption. Um, we're trying to optimize psychological safety. You know, it's very difficult to try to kind of poof it out of nothing, but we're really trying to make this environment as psychologically safe as possible to remind one another that it's essential to hear all of the voices in the room, that sometimes we have trouble doing that in healthcare environments and that we're really gonna to try to support that in this conversation. So I, I really love that question from the Q&A and just wanted to emphasize those things. But this is a rapid debriefing it's organized largely around plus delta. What went well? What was difficult? Let's explore the root causes of those things. Let's try to keep doing the successes and let's try to solve one of the challenges or queue up the solving of one of those challenges um, and maybe escalating information or giving information to people who can help us with that solution. Mary, I, what did I miss? I just, I, you know, I want to add just one thing in here, Chris, because the, the question has come up a couple other times, which is sort of around mistakes and confidentiality in, in these debriefings. And we, we really strongly encourage and how people have been implementing circle of debriefings is that anything that comes out of the debriefings is anonymous, is de-identified, you know, in, in the crazy world of practice that we've all been dealing with, um, with COVID things don't always go perfectly because we're dealing with the unknown. And they are especially the things that we want to talk about in debriefing because we want to get to like, what were the system issues 
that caused this to happen because that's going to show us the pathway forward to improving the system so that it doesn't happen again. People are going to be much more willing, I think, to speak up and explore those things if they know that what happens in the debriefing is confidential. Hmm. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, you want to talk about, about roles? Yeah, let's talk about our debriefing team. And for Circle Up, we need a particular team. Of course, you need your lead facilitator, this person who's going to step forward and say, let's have this great conversation and here's why we're having it. And we do recommend if you have a willing person available, a co-facilitator, and this person can support the lead facilitator in various ways, including noticing people that want to talk, noticing that some people haven't spoken, that we need a more well-rounded conversation, um, capturing, helping to capture information or direct the capture of information. Ideally, we have a scribe. In fact, you really need a scribe, someone to write down what's happening. And yeah. then someone identified to carry the learning from this debriefing forward to the next shift, forward to the people who can help with solutions. This can all be the same person. <laughs> this has been one person in several occasions. Even better if you can to build a team around this because it creates a sense of community around the doing mm -hmm. of it and also tremendous satisfaction among the people who are doing it, that they're part of it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think if there's one thing that we've heard over and over again, it's just that, Chris, that it's, you know, it's so satisfying, both the supportive aspects of it, but also like the ability to get stuff done quickly. And I think that comes down to the scribe and the action item leader, people that um, really can follow through on what's been identified. And, you know, I love Steph has, they had their, um, their circle up notebook, which was literally a binder where information was captured, put in the binder and people went back to that binder on a daily basis to make sure that items had been taken care of and to see if there was anything else outstanding. And, and it's, it's been very satisfying for them. So we've got a, um, we've got a video of Lon um, who's going to talk about debriefing. And what I particularly like about this video is how the debriefing is also a form of peer support. And we've heard that over and over again. And, and one of the things uh, that Steph Langford said one time about the debriefing was, you know, once the debriefing is done, my heart and mind is free. I've, you know, I've handed off my patients. I've talked about what happened that day. I can go home and I can relax, which I think is incredibly important um, in these times. So let's hear what Lon has to say. It was clear in our organization based on previous uh, staff surveys that people had a real hard time leaving work behind. And because we're an emergency department, mm -hmm. the work never ends. We put a lot of energy into trying to make sure that the system allowed them to sign out their care before ten, the last 10 minutes of their shift. And then everybody could meet the last 10 minutes of their shift for uh, the debrief. Some of the nurses um, talked about hard things that they'd been through. One of them felt that they'd made a mistake and had to, had to self-report a mistake that had happened. And one of, the, one of the other nurses, one of their colleagues spoke up and he said something that just blew me away, which was, remember that all of our mistakes came from trying to care for a patient. And we didn't get the outcome that we wanted, but that wasn't our plan when we made that decision. And so he asked the question, so can we, can we learn from it and still remember that that happened because we were caring in another way for another patient most of the time, um, which, is, which is what had happened in this instance. The nurse's attention had been pulled in another direction and something happened with the patient. Mm -hmm. And so they felt that they had made a mistake, but the other nurse was able to reframe it for them was that that wasn't your plan, that you, you were actually providing care for another patient during that time. And um, I think that was a really great moment where people could change how they thought about having some, something negative having happened in their oh, department. Goodness. People are leaving feeling like they know what it is that they do that makes their job successful and they can teach each other and they can feel good about their work when they leave and they can also leave it behind. So Chris, I think this is a good time for some questions. We're doing good on time. So how about we take about three or four minutes and do some questions here? Yes, let's do it. Okay. Damien? So I think the presentation so far seems 
fairly clear to folks, not a lot of uh, detail level questions. Okay. I think the general topic um, is around, can you give some examples and uh, how, you know, what do these conversations <clears throat> sound like, feel like, uh, any examples I think would be helpful mm. to folks. Mm -hmm. Great. I'd, um, I'd add that, you know, well, let me start here, Damien, based on what you just said. Um, part of the theme that we really got from Lon and others, but Lon's comments represent this beautifully, is that once you open up these conversations, the team starts to solve problems for itself and the team starts to support itself. And I think about this um, as being such a powerful example of how this tool takes some of the burden off of organizational leaders who, who think they have to do everything themselves. The burden is on installing this system and implementing this system, but once you have it implemented and once people understand the ground rules, the team starts to talk and the team starts to contribute its solutions and again, support one another. And, and Lon gave us some beautiful examples of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's not just you talking, it's others talking once you've created the space for them to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Chris, you had earlier referenced um, a plus Delta format um, for the debriefings. And so as, you know, as we see these debriefings, happening. Um, and one of the things that, that Lon told me that's not in this video, they were trying to figure out the timing. And so they all made a commitment to get patient handoffs done uh, with 10 minutes to spare before the end of their shift. And that's the 10 minutes that they use to debrief. And so in that debriefing, the debriefings are structured as a general check-in question. How's everybody doing right now? You know, to sort of get the emotional tenor of the room and see if anyone has any really pressing concerns that are causing them a lot of anxiety or stress. Um, and then to go through what were our challenges today? Did we stumble? Let's explore that a little bit. Um, and then always talk about what were our successes today? Like where did we knock it out of the park? Because people are constantly in this crazy environment, figuring out new ways to innovate and better ways to do things. And from both those challenges and the successes, the scribe would be taking notes um, during the debriefing. Also in the debriefing, you know, what, what we're finding is once people talk a bit about the clinical work they've done, it also very often surfaces the emotional aspects of what they've done. And so we also suggest that in the debriefing that there is a specific invitation to say, does anybody want to talk about anything that's really troubling them um, about what happened on the shift today? So providing a little bit of space um, from that. And then kind of a final summary before the debriefing ends of what are our action items? Who do those action items need to get to? Is it the quality and safety team? Is it the nursing manager? Is it the medical director of the unit? But really closing that, that quality loop as I think about it is I think a, a structure that's been successful for, for a lot of the folks that are using Circle Up. Mary, one yeah. of the questions that is on here is, you know, what breaks the ice at the beginning when a group is immobilized by fear or emotion? Do you use humor? Uh, kind of any uh -huh. techniques? Yeah. The other um, yeah. question I, I want, did want to highlight for you all is around the aspect of social distance. Um, how many people both for the conversation and for the social distance, how many people do you have in the room and how do mm -hmm. you space it out? Yeah. I did answer some of that on, on the chat, but I did oh, thank you. come up. So it's worth yeah. discussing. You know, I think that, um, you know, with regard to the question of how do you break the ice in the debriefing, um, I would go back to not thinking about the debriefing as an isolated incident, but thinking about briefing peer check-ins and debriefing as being that connected system. And so I think it's really important when starting circle up to have multiple touch points throughout the day so that the debriefing isn't the first time that the team is sitting down to talk together. You know, ideally they would have connected at multiple points leading up to that so that by the time they get to the debriefing, they're quite used to talking to each other. Having said that, it doesn't always work that way. Um, and I think sometimes as a compassionate caregiver is, you know, we all are, you may find yourself in a room where you're seeing lots of heightened emotion, perhaps people upset, there could have been, you know, a tragic death um, that day. And, you know, I think at those times we need to pay attention to people's emotions first 
And if a lot of the process protocol stuff doesn't get done in that debriefing, you've still done a great service to the unit and to future patients by just giving the clinicians time to just kind of air what's, what's, what's inside emotionally and what's bothering them emotionally. And there's a really actually an important clinical reason to do that. You know, we often think of like the touchy feely communication stuff on one side and the clinical care on the other side. But we know from research that when people are emotionally stressed, they make poorer clinical decisions. And so there is a real clinical reason to pay attention to people's emotions. And so if in a debriefing, we don't get to the clinical stuff, but we spend some, a good five or 10 minutes just helping people deal with their emotions, we will still make progress clinically. On the humor point, you know, on the humor point, there's, yeah. you know, the formal recommendation is no, don't force humor. Mm -hmm. um, but if you open up a conversation that starts to feel good, and, and again, don't think of it as one conversation, think of it as starting up the engine and now it's, it's a system of communication mm -hmm. that's running day, day after day, um, your team will introduce humor and lightheartedness, um, not necessarily a joke that's kind of shoved in there. And you know, we've heard great examples of people including a brief lighthearted moment even a YouTube that's funny, um, as an example, I think it was Damien that told me about that. Um, but what you're really doing is just opening up this opportunity for the team to express itself. And some of that humor will happen. The team will bring it. Some things will feel very serious. Some things will feel in between. If I could comment as a beneficiary of the circle up process, when, when we did some of this in the emergency department where I work, I think, um, what's really interesting is the pairing of the debriefing of the clinical activity and processes with the people support, that web that Mary is talking about. So I think a moment of humor, a video, something really not so work related creates that connection amongst people mm -hmm. when you're feeling isolated, stressed, uh, tired. Uh, so I, I agree with what Chris said, like it's not formally recommended. I think what is formally recommended is be yourself, there be you go. present, be fully there. That's a good way and to That's that. helped me both as a yeah. debriefer when it's been my turn to lead them and as a participant when it's been my turn to, mm -hmm. to experience or benefit from it. Well said. Yes. Well, Hate to break it to you guys, but we're coming to the end of the hour. I so know, if I you, know. Uh, I was just thinking as soon you, as I said, hey, we're doing good on time. Let's take some questions. Hmm. We'll just move along now. How's that? <laughs> Thank you, Damien, for keeping us on track. So I just want to briefly give you a visual of what the workflow for Circle Up might look like. And so we see in the beginning of a shift, um, there is a briefing huddle. Um, people and processes to plan our day. And then throughout the shift, there may be some event-based circle ups when challenging procedures come up, a peer check-in here and there to see how your colleagues are doing. And then at the end of that shift, there would be a debriefing huddle. Now, one of the critical elements of circle up is that all of the learning that happens in that debriefing gets communicated to the next shift that's coming in. And then that second shift would have the same sort of cycle of event-based um, check-in or event-based circle ups and some peer check-ins with a debriefing at the end. And then again, making sure that that loop gets closed to the next group of people that are coming in that may be about staffing patterns or, or PPE guidelines. The exact timing of that is going to be dictated by your local unit culture. And as I said before, don't let perfection be the enemy of progress. If it's time for debriefing and six out of the eight people who were there that day can come to the debriefing and two can't, do the debriefing because more communication is better than no communication at all. Someone in the questions asked about how do you get themes and patterns out of the data from mm. Circle Up? And so your, your, your first basic step is to have, the, have some information and have the data. And... Um, to Mary's point, there's this passing of information from debriefing to briefing, and from shift to shift, and from day to day, or group to group. And one of the best practices that we've heard about, it's just very simple, is to take your briefing and debriefing scripts and put three holes into them, or copy them, and put them into a binder. And of course, they have a date and a time on them. And now you have this story 
of what you've spoken about, what you've solved, what you spoke about the next time, what you solved that day. And you have this running theme. And hopefully, um, to answer that question a little bit more specifically that was asked, hopefully you also have a team that's looking at that data, that's pulling out those themes that are now there in these binders, in this raw material. And you're using that information to make decisions, to support your people, to maybe change up staffing and resourcing. And if you're an academic kind of person, of course, to write a write a paper about or write an article about and, and contribute to the learning of, of the worldwide community. All right, Chris, we've got about five minutes left in the whole hour, just to let okay. you know where we are on time. And so if you want to cover these process roadmaps and then so we can if you wanted to circle up, you need some roadmaps and some cognitive aids to remind you of what goes into a briefing, remind you of what goes into an event based circle up. As we check in with our peers, what's the process? This page here that, that we're showing you is just kind of card sized cut out roadmaps that um, we provide to our collaborators. So Mary, you can just click through these okay. a card for briefing, a card for event based circle ups, maybe a wall poster to hang on the wall, a debriefing roadmap. And these are just reminders and prompts. And we also have a much larger set of scripts um, available to the, the organizations that we collaborate with. Mm -hmm. And we, we all need these reminders. If, if I'm running a circle up briefing, I will probably bring my cognitive aid with me, even though I know it, I know it well, it's just a great reminder for the, for the distracted individual. Wow. Okay, go ahead and click on through. Thanks, Chris. We are to hear Damien. I know that we, um, in the long run, we're not great managers of time. So, uh, willing to take direction from you about what we'll you We'll have to take to that next. to the debrief, Mary. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll have to discuss that as our Uh oh, I think you're area. in trouble, Chris. It will help us for the next time that we do it. <laughs> no, I, I, th I think on the plus side, we were able to integrate the questions into the conversation yeah. and yeah. Uh, that magical thing that, uh, you know, as people are asking, you're answering and, and yeah. we're just saying, yep, that's being answered live. Okay. Um, I think uh, I, I would just say one Sorry. one quick thing for you to yep. consider is a, I think an innovative question that says, hey, what about having an open plus delta board during the day that could be summarized, oh, that could be uh, cool looked idea. at later. And I think Lon cool and his group are doing something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote an, another answer to a question. I think any of these moves uh, are, a, are a strong signal that you're listening to your team yeah. and it goes a long way. I think uh, there's just yeah. frankly too much, oh yeah, we're here, we're listening, we want input and not enough action to support that. Yeah. And doing a board like that and actually reading it or having a um, WhatsApp group. Um, my wife is an emergency physician. They have a WhatsApp group and there's just constant great idea. discussion yeah. and connectedness that way. So let's, let's, wrap up. Okay. let's wrap up the session uh, so we can get folks uh, onto their, sadly, onto their next Zoom <laughs> meeting. Um, if you don't mind clicking, I, I want to thank you, Chris and Mary, for bringing these ideas to, to all of us and, uh, and for giving us a, a sense of the tip of the iceberg on what's possible when mm. you take conversation and taking and caring for people at their workplace so uh kudos to you for your work and thank you Danny. um thank you. and i look forward to hearing about how it it continues to spread worldwide we have we're going to have a pandemic of circle up uh ideally uh those of you who joined uh i'm really glad you stuck it out join us next week when walter epic who's an associate professor at northwestern and a principal faculty with us at the Center for Medical Simulation will be discussing Learn Through Talk, the synergies between simulation and workplace learning. It's the subject of his PhD dissertation and uh, a great blend of uh, academic and practical advice and uh, do register through our website. And if you're thinking about next steps, if you click for me, Mary, you're thinking about next steps with Circle Up, which I hope you are, uh, and you're thinking about trying it out, please do and keep in contact, let us know. And if you think that uh, you think the Center for Medical Simulation would be a good partner to do this, then don't uh, hesitate for a moment to contact us or signal in the evaluations that you'd like to discuss further. 
because as um, Chris and Mary have uh, highlighted, we do love to partner and, and support mm -hmm. folks as they're doing it because it's great work and that's what we're here for. So have a fantastic rest of your day and uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.